next we have Wadi Taylor, who is going to be telling us about identifying equivalent Glabiau topologies, a discrete challenge for math and physics for machine learning. Okay, thanks very much, Laura. Um, I think my internet connection might be a little um, clunky right now because uh, things are lagging. So uh, tell me if I'm not being clear or um, if something is lagging, uh, I can try to do something like reset something. Um, anyway, well, thanks very much uh, to Yang and the other organizers for putting this symposium together. Um, lots of lots of good things going on. I'm sorry, I can't go to all the talks, but I'm hoping to catch up on, on many that I missed on, on the uh, recordings. Um, so I'm going to take the opportunity today to talk about um, some nice connections, I think, between geometry and physics and discrete mathematics that set us up for problems that, in principle, we may be able to get some help from machine learning on. And uh, so I'm going to start by talking about some aspects of Calabi Yao manifolds related to um, some work with my former student, Yu Qian Huang. Uh, we had uh, three or four papers, but the, I'll highlight the one here, which kind of uh, culminates that set of work, which I'll talk about. Um, and then some preliminary work with uh, Vishnu Jajala and Andrew Turner. Um, so, sorry, here we go. So, uh, the objects I'm going to talk about today are Calabi Yao manifolds, uh, Calabi Yao threefolds, by which I really mean real six dimensional manifolds with three complex dimensions. And these are geometries that have been used for decades now in compactifying superstring theory to get interesting physics models. And at the same time, they play a key role in mathematics as an important class of models with a trivial canonical class. So um, just to kind of emphasize the, both the physical and the mathematical uh, significance of these, on the physics side, these are manifolds which admit a Ricci flat metric, meaning that they solve the vacuum Einstein equations so that we can compactify. We have a, some 10 dimensional theory. We can wrap up six of the dimensions on these uh, Calabi Yau complex three folds, solve the Einstein equations on those, and then get a good theory in the remaining four dimensions. Um, these manifolds also have a complex structure, which from the physics point of view means that they're compatible with preserving supersymmetry. Um, and mathematically means that they have a Kähler structure. So these are uh, very nice, both from a physics and mathematics point of view. And they've been studied for decades. Uh, there are some very nice books. Uh, our, our host, Young, and also uh, Tristan Hoops, who I, I think I saw was here actually, have written uh, nice books which give introductions to Calabi Yaos. I'm just going to touch on these things. Um, but uh, yeah, Hoops, Hoops wrote a great book called uh, Calabi Yao Bestiary. I've always liked that title. Um, which has uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about in terms of the basic structure of Calabi Yau manifolds is, is described if you want more detail in those books. Uh, but as I say, these have been used in the compactification of string theory uh, from 10 dimensions down to four dimensions. Also more recently, as I'll discuss in a little more detail, uh, using F theory down to six dimensions. So despite the fact that people have been studying these Calabi Yau manifolds for decades now, there's a very fundamental question, which is, are there a finite number of distinct topological types of Calabi Yau threefolds? And the answer to that question is still open, uh, although I think we have a bit more insight now than we did a couple decades ago on that. Um, there are large classes of Calabi Yau threefolds that have been constructed using different methodologies. So uh, one of the earliest sets of Calabi Yau manifolds that were constructed were so-called CCs or complete intersection Calabi Yaus where you have some space and then you look at a complete intersection of many hypersurfaces. Um, there are about 8,000 of those threefolds. These have been generalized uh, by our, our host, Laura Anderson and James Gray, who's also here at Prutzi, Gao and Lee also, uh, to generalize CCs, which is a much larger, larger class. A very huge class, which I'll talk about a bit in this, in this talk, are the so-called toric hypersurface Calabi Yau threefolds, of which there are 470 some million. Um, based on polytopes, which I'll describe in a little more detail in a few minutes. And Kreutzer and Skarka gave a, a complete and systematic analysis of those. And there's a nice online database of that almost 500 million different polytopes, each of which gives us a Calabi Yau threefold. So that, that set, which is the set I'll focus on a bit in today's discussion, um, is the largest known set of Calabi Yau manifolds. So it's very large, but it's finite. And of course, the question is, um, is that a representative list? Is it even close? or are there some infinite family that we're missing? Um, another class, which is of particular interest, uh, are the elliptic Calabi Yau threefolds. And I'll also talk a bit more about those today. Um, 
and in work of Antonella Grassi and uh, myself with various collaborators and, and many others, we've been uh, studying those in recent years based on the physics of F theory, which gives us a very good handle on this set of Calabi-Ath refolds. Um, and I'll come back to that, but that's actually a finite set. Okay, so those are Calabi-Ath refolds. Um, so it sounds kind of complicated and abstract, but at some basic combinatorial level, uh, Calabi-Ath refolds can be determined and characterized by a very small set of discrete, well, not necessarily so small, but by a set of discrete data. Um, using Wall's theorem, we can characterize a Calabi-Ath refolds topological type uh, by two integers, uh, two non-negative integers, the Hodge numbers, H11 and H21. Um, the first Pontryagin class or, or second Chern class, uh, appropriate we tie into Chern here, uh, which is just a vector of integers. And then perhaps the most important structure, which is something I'll focus on today, is a three index tensor, um, each of whose elements is integral, uh, which is indexed by three numbers ranging from one to this number H11. So this is sort of a, a three index analog of a matrix, and that will play a key role in the later part of what I'm going to talk about today when we get to the machine learning questions. Um, so the bottom line of that is that uh, while it's, you know, an abstract geometrical thing that algebraic geometers talk about, at the end of the day, we can characterize certain important aspects of Calabi-Ath threefolds by a finite list of integers. And so a couple of fundamental questions are, first of all, which sets of integer data are allowed and give us a Calabi-Ath threefold? And second of all, if somebody gives you two sets of integer data, can you tell whether it's the same Calabi-Ath? Uh, in other words, is there some basis change between the H11 indices that takes one set of calabi data to another set of calabi data that would describe the same geometry? And, uh, and as far as I know, no complete answer is known to either of these two questions. Uh, and I'm going to focus a little more on the second question today. Um, and again, if anybody has questions, please just chime in. Happy to answer questions as we go or, of course, at the end. Okay. So uh, let me talk a little bit about this toric hypersurface construction, which is the thing that gives us the biggest set of calabi manifolds. Um, the basic idea is, again, it's a very combinatorial construction. We take a d-dimensional uh, lattice, ZD. We choose a set of rays. So here, D is actually one bigger than the dimension of the calabi you want. So for a threefold, we would want a four-dimensional uh, lattice, Z to the four. We choose a finite set of rays in that lattice, which correspond to what will become uh, divisors or co-dimension one hypersurfaces um, in that ambient space. And then we choose a particular kind of hypersurface um, based on the sum of all those divisors. Uh, basically, we choose a polynomial, which is of degree one in each of the divisors, roughly speaking. Um, and that defines, uh, a hypersurface in this in this geometric space. So this is sort of a, a a poor a poor person's version of algebraic geometry that allows us to do everything by combinatorics. Um, let me actually show you a picture, and I'll come back to this slide just to make this more clear. Um, a simple example of this is constructing a Calabi-Yau onefold as a hypersurface in a two-dimensional complex projective space CP two three one. So let me just walk through that, which is is sort of a clear and simple. Um, example of how to use this discrete data to construct a, a, an elliptic curve. And then I'll go back to the more abstract thing on the previous slide. So basically, here's this. In this case, we start with a two-dimensional lattice, Z2, and we choose some rays. And in this case, the rays we choose are 2, 3, 0, minus 1, and minus 1, 0. And those three rays define a toric variety, which is the complex projective space P231. This is a... Uh, a reflexive polytope, meaning that it has only one interior point. So we look at the, the convex hull of these three rays. It defines this nice triangle, and it's only got one interior point. And that's the kind of thing we need to get a calabi -Yau. We can go from this triangle, this polytope, to the dual polytope, which is the set of vertices in Z2, which whose inner products with each of the rays here is greater than or equal to minus one, the so-called dual polytope. And associated with each vertex of the dual polytope, there's a monomial. And basically, we can then 
define a hypersurface in this two-dimensional toric variety by writing an algebraic curve, which in this case takes this uh, Tate form of a Weierstrass model, where we take each of those monomials in this dual polytope and multiply them by a complex number. So this gives us a formula for, oops, sorry. Um, gives us a formula for a hypersurface in this P231, which is a Calabi one-fold, which is an elliptic curve. So an elliptic curve is basically a, a geometrically a torus with a complex structure. And this is a nice way of realizing uh, a Calabi one-fold or an elliptic curve in the context of this Batarev construction. Uh, if we take this Tate form, we can complete the square uh, complete in Y, complete the cube in X, and we get the so-called short form or, of the virus truss, which is Y squared equals X cubed plus FX plus G. So that's a formula for an elliptic curve that we can derive from this kind of simple combinatorial toric construction. So now let me just go back to the general statement, which is if we go now to Z4 or a higher dimensional ZD, uh, there's a set of rays. We then, again, write down an anti-canonical hypersurface, the generalization of that Weierstrass equation. Um, the monomials in that hypersurface correspond to the lattice points, again, in the dual polytope, a set of points whose inner product is greater than or equal to minus one. Um, and so using this approach, Kreutzer and Skarka constructed this 470 million reflexive uh, four-dimensional polytopes, and these describe uh, calabi yau threefolds. And among other things, this uh, construction gives us a nice picture of mirror symmetry where the polytope and the dual polytope describe mirror calabi yau manifolds where the Hodge numbers get switched. You can compute the Hodge numbers easily, uh, the H11 and H21, from the combinatorics of the construction. Um, and this was early evidence for mirror symmetry. Okay, so those, that's the set of uh, toric hypersurface calabi yaus. Um, now let me say a little bit about elliptic calabi yaus. Um, an elliptic or genus one fibered calabi yau is a calabi yau which is formed from some base with an elliptic curve like the ones we just talked about over each point. So basically uh, we have what's called a Weierstrass model where we write that Weierstrass equation, X squared equals Y cubed plus FX plus G. But now F and G are essentially functions or more technically sections of certain bundles over the base manifold. So now we choose a, a complex two dimensional manifold and we fiber an elliptic curve over that, and that gives us a so-called elliptic calabi threefold. So these are nice because they have extra structure. They're more manageable mathematically. Um, I, I and others have been interested in them for in recent years because they're used for constructing six-dimensional supergravity theories through the approach of F-theory. Um, and a particularly interesting thing that has been uh, coming up in recent years is we have an increasing amount of evidence that most known calabi threefolds have elliptic or genus one structure. That is that they are birationally equivalent to an elliptic or genus one fiber calabi threefold. Um, and I'll review the evidence for that in a few minutes, which uh, many of the, some of the people here, uh, Lara and James in particular, have been involved in, in accumulating this evidence. I'll come back to the, uh, some of that evidence in a minute. But first, let me go through sort of a general argument for why it may be that um, most calabi yaus have some elliptic structure. So first, let me emphasize that there is a finite number of different topological types of elliptic calabi yau threefolds. Unlike for the general calabi yau threefold, where we do not know whether there are a finite number, for elliptic calabi yau threefolds, there are a finite number. This was proved um, by Gross some years back. Um, and really building on the work of Grassi, we can essentially uh, make a constructive argument that enumerates more or less this finite set of elliptic calabi yau threefolds. Uh, basically, there are, there are a finite set of bases that support these elliptic calabi yau threefolds. So roughly speaking, we can run through all the possible bases, which are uh, blow-ups more or less of the Hirzebruck surfaces and P2. And then for each base, we can look at the Weierstrass models over that base. And there are a finite number of strata in the set of those uh, Weierstrass models, which have a beautiful picture in terms of F theory, in terms of gauge groups and matter. So there's a nice mapping between um, F theory, the, the physics and the, the mathematics of the geometry, uh, which essentially allows us using a combination of physical intuition from F theory and mathematics to get a global picture of the set of elliptic calabi threefolds. Um, so 
we have a good handle on elliptic Calabi-Yau threefolds. Even though we don't have a good handle on the general set of Calabi-Yau threefolds, it seems like most Calabi-Yau threefolds are actually elliptic. So if it is in fact the case that most Calabi-Yau threefolds are elliptic, then we would have a clear argument that there are a finite number of Calabi-Yau threefolds, but can't quite prove that yet. So let me, uh, again, make a few general comments about why it should be that a Calabi-Yau threefold has an elliptic or genus one fiber. Uh, and then I'll talk more about the evidence that in fact, most of them do. So there's a theorem uh, by Aguiso and Wilson uh, proven in the threefold case, um, which is that a, a Calabi-Yau threefold is genus one or elliptically fibered if and only if there exists a divisor that satisfies d cubed equals zero. So this is basically d contracted with itself under the triple intersection form. So it's like cijk, di, dj, dk uh, equals zero. d squared is not equal zero. Uh, if d squared was equal to zero, we'd have something more like a, a K3 surface. Um, and d dot c is non-negative for all algebraic curves c. So there's a positivity condition. So the question is, should this usually be the case? If, if we're given sort of random data for a Calabi-Yau threefold, would you expect there to be such a divisor? So this can give us sort of a, uh, a heuristic understanding of whether we should expect Calabi-Yau threefolds to be elliptic or not. So to go through sort of a heuristic argument here, let's just assume we have some random data for a triple intersection form. In other words, we don't know what kind of structure constrains the triple intersection form. There are some, some rules about that, but let's just assume for the moment that it's essentially a random uh, triple inter set of triple intersection numbers and ask how likely is it that such a Calabi-Yau would be uh, elliptically fibered. So the possible obstructions to the existence of such a curve D that we need for this theorem are twofold. One, of, one possibility is because this is a set of equations over the integers, it may be that there's some number theoretic obstruction. That is, we may write down the set of equations over the integers, and there may just not be a solution. A second possibility is that there may be solutions, but there may be no solution over the reals when we're in the positive cone. So let's just briefly consider each of those possibilities. Um, so the, the kind of thing that might happen for the number theoretic obstructions is as follows. Um, let's look at this cubic equation over the integers. Uh, there are four variables, x, y, z, and w. You might think, okay, a cubic equation in four variables, you should be able to solve it, but you can't solve this equation over the integers. Um, and it's actually pretty easy to see why not. Uh, imagine that x or y is odd. If x and y are both odd, then the first three terms sum to an odd number, and therefore we can't get zero because the other two terms are even. If x is odd, but y is even, then only the first term is odd. So again, the whole thing is odd and we can't get zero. If y is odd and x is even, similarly, we can't get zero. So x and y both have to be even. But if x and y are both even, then all the terms except the z term are divisible by four. And that means that z can't be odd because the whole thing would be congruent to two mod zero. So z has to be even. But if x, y, and z are even, then the first four terms are all divisible by eight. And that means that W can't be odd because then it would be congruent to four mod zero. So W has to be even. But if X, Y, Z, and W are all even, then divide all those numbers by two, we should have another solution. And so we should have a solution where one of the numbers is odd and yet we've just proven we can't. So that, this is a very simple example of a, a Z2 obstruction to a cubic equation in the integers having a set of solutions. Um, and there's some beautiful mathematics work. Uh, in 1937, Mordell identified homogeneous degree D polynomials in D squared variables that have a similar kind of obstruction. And this led to conjectures that in fact, D squared might be the maximum number of variables in which you would have an obstruction. Uh, this was proven for D equals one and D equals two. It was proven to be false for the quartic because a counterexample was found where there's a quartic with 17 variables, which you will note is one more than 16, which does have an obstruction. It's not quite clear for cubics, which is our case of interest. Um, Heath Brown showed that every non-singular cubic in more than 10, more than or equal to 10 variables with rational coefficients has a non-trivial rational zero. And it's proven that a general cubic in at least 16 variables uh, has, a, has a zero. Um, so the answer is not quite clear where the cutoff is, but at 
as soon as you get to H11 above 15, this essentially proves that there's no number theoretic obstruction to having a solution of um, the cubic equation over the integers. Um, so we are always going to have some divisor D, which satisfies D cubed equals zero, as long as H11 is bigger than 15. It's likely that it only has to be nine, but we haven't got a proof of that. Um, and so the number theoretic obstruction cannot stop us from having a Calabi Yau, um, which has an elliptic fiber, from having an elliptic vibration of our Calabi Yau as long as H11 is sufficiently big. Okay, so that's the, the number theoretic obstruction. Uh, then we can ask, how about a cone obstruction? And roughly speaking, it seems that uh, this should provide an exponential suppression on the probability that you don't have a uh, curve satisfying the desired properties. And I'm just going to give a very simple heuristic argument. Um, assume that the cone has um, some sum of divisors with coefficients that are positive. So basically that it's sort of a generalization of an octant. That's not necessarily a good assumption, but um, let, let's make that assumption. With that assumption, um, if we look for a positive solution of the cubic, we can kind of proceed by induction. We first check for m equals two. It's a cubic in two variables. A cubic in two variables is going to have at least one real solution. There's a 50% chance that that's going to be uh, in the proper cone. Um, if we add a variable, we pick random other numbers in the cone. Again, there's a probability that there's a solution in the last variable that's positive, which is one half. So very heuristically, we might kind of expect that the probability would go down as one over two to the H11, that there is no uh, fiber in the proper, there's no, there's no divisor D in the proper cone. Um, and again, this depends on um, having a, a sort of a large Kähler cone. There's some, um, there's some evidence um, that, the, that the, the Kähler cone may get small, so there could be ways of evading this. I'll come back to that again in a minute or two. Uh, let's see. I think I want to move quickly so I can get through the uh, to the machine learning part. But let me just sort of summarize uh, some of the evidence that, in fact, most Calabi Yaws are elliptically fibered. So as I mentioned, uh, Laura James and collaborators have analyzed the CCs. They found that uh, over 99% of the CCs 78, 37 out of the known 78, out of the 78, 90 of the CCs have an obvious elliptic vibration. Um, many of them have multiple inequivalent uh, obvious vibrations. And as long as H11 is bigger than four, they get it, or bigger than or equal to four, they get at least one vibration. Um, with Yu Chen Huang, we took two approaches to analyzing the Kreutzer Skarka database. On the one hand, we constructed elliptic, elliptic Calabia threefolds, as I say, by choosing the bases, tuning, and comparing to Kreutzer Skarka. On the other hand, we directly studied the toric hypersurfaces and looked for vibrations by finding a toric, uh, sorry, a reflexive polytope that was a subpolytope of the 4D polytope. And this approach of just looking for somewhat obvious toric uh, vibrations showed that 99.994% uh, of the Kreutzer-Skarka constructions have a manifest elliptic fiber, which in technically means that in some phase, that is some um, some 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 phase in the Kähler cone, um, these guys have a uh, elliptic vibration. So here's a, a graph of this is a graph of the Hodge numbers of the uh, 470 whatever million uh, polytopes the the, the Calabi Yaws associated with those 470 million polytopes in the Kreutzer Skarka database. Um, the Hodge numbers in red are the ones for which there are examples that uh, do not have an obvious 2D fiber corresponding to an elliptic fiber. Um, so that's about 30,000 out of the 470 million. Um, some interesting questions about exactly how those numbers are distributed, but I'll leave that. Um, and again, asymptotically, we can look at the probability that a Calabia threefold is not elliptically fibered. If we look at just small H11, these numbers drop more or less as a power of two to the n. You know, we got 0 0.6, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0 0.05, 0 0.024, but there's a fat tail. So this is what it would look like. Um, the the uh, this, this is what it would look like if it was just uh, the two to the power. The um, actual number is a little bit bigger. Um, so why there's a fat tail, it's not quite clear. Uh, it may be that there are, um, non-toric fibers. 
It may be uh, that this has to do with the Kähler cone becoming narrow, which would uh, cause the argument I gave to, uh, for the asymptotics to break down somewhat. Um, so these are, these are interesting questions, um, but let me proceed um, and talk about a question which is related to this question, um, but which, which ties us into this question of uh, how to solve discrete problems with machine learning. Um, so I'm gonna slightly change gears here. Uh, any, any questions about the uh, elliptic, prevalence of elliptic vibrations uh, before I move on to a related but slightly distinct question, which is if we're given the data for two Calabi-Yau's, uh, when are these the same? So in the analysis I was just describing, both in the analysis of the CCs that, that Laura and James and company did and the analysis of the uh, toric hypersurface calabi -Yaus, the approach we took was to use the structure of those definitions of the calabi -Yau to isolate the, the fibers, not by appealing directly to the combinatorial data I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, that is the triple intersection numbers. But let's return to that data. From each of those constructions, you can essentially compute the triple intersection numbers that I mentioned at the beginning. Again, it's like a three index analog of a matrix. It's symmetric in all three indices. It's a bunch of numbers indexed from ijk from one to n, where n is h11 of x. And the question is, if we're given two sets of triple intersection numbers, can we find a basis change in SLNZ that relates these two things. So, you know, if you're interested in, in combinatorial problems in machine learning um, and, and the, not as interested in the geometry, you can sort of retune in here. Basically, we have a very simple math problem. We're given two three index tensors with in, entries in the integers. And the question is, is there a basis change so that these things are the same? It's the kind of problem you see in linear algebra one, but it's now on a thing with three indices, and that makes the problem harder. As far as I know, there is no finite time algorithm at the current time to tell whether two such sets of triple intersection numbers are the same. There are some invariants. Um, I think Tristan mentioned some of those in his book, um, which might allow you to tell if they are different, if the invariants are different, but I don't think there's a finite time algorithm for checking if they are the same. <clears throat> so, before, so how, how do we approach this? Well, we don't know a good math algorithm, so it's natural in the current era to speculate that uh, you know computers are getting very good at solving hard problems that we don't know how to solve. Can we throw some machine learning algorithms at this problem and maybe get some insight? I, I mean, my hope in some sense for um, some of the progress that's being made in machine learning applied to physics is that we can use machine learning algorithms to make hypotheses about really concrete, mathematically testable questions, which we can then perhaps prove rigorously. Um, and our host, Young, has written a very nice book, The Calabi Al Landscape from Geometry to Physics to Machine Learning, that talks about a number of efforts to apply machine learning to different questions in Calabi Al geometries. Um, so, this is an example of that sort of thing. And again, for some of the background in machine learning, I'd refer you to his book. So, we're given this problem. It's not the kind of problem that is obvious or natural for machine learning algorithms. Machine learning algorithms are very good at taking large amounts of data and for instance, categorizing them into dogs and cats and things like that. Doing things where uh, you can kind of imagine that a steepest descent is going to give you some, some classification or something like that. There are arenas, for instance, uh, Alpha Zero that plays Go and, and, and also chess very well has learned how to play these discrete games, um, imply that there are ways of applying machine learning algorithms that will solve difficult discrete problems. But at the same time, there are fundamental questions like solving Diophantine equations, which are computationally difficult, which are not obviously uh, in the domain of the current realm of machine learning algorithms. So part of the goal here is to solve the physics problem and the math problem. And part of the goal is to understand, can we use machine learning to get a handle on these kinds of discrete problems where a small change, I mean, for instance, if I change one of these numbers, one of these integers by one, it completely changes the answer. And that's a little different from a picture of a dog and a cat. If I take a picture of a dog 
and I change one pixel, everyone would say it's still a picture of a dog. It's not a picture of a cat. But if I take a CIJK and I change one entry by one digit, you know, 15 to 16, that completely changes the data on the Calabi Yao. Of course, Calabi Yao manifolds presumably are constrained in some way that we don't really understand. So the hope is that some clever machine learning algorithm might help us to unravel that hidden structure that we don't really appreciate. So this is a hard problem. And if we just throw a machine learning algorithm at it, it doesn't really uh, give us immediately um, the right answers, except in, in simple cases where um, things are relatively transparent. Um, so let me shift to a slightly different but related question and ask, how does machine learning do on a simpler problem where we do know how to get the answer, uh, which has a similar flavor, um, but which has the same kind of discrete and combinatorial challenge to it. So let's turn to the, a simpler question, which is, let's just drop one of the indices. Instead of CIJK, let's just ask, given two matrices, AIJ and BIJ, um, when does there exist a transformation so that those are the same? And we can ask this in the integer context, or we can ask it in the context of complex values and integer transformations. So if we ask the question, when are two matrices related by a unitary transformation, there's a known answer to that question. And there's a nice theorem called Specht's theorem, which says that A and B are related through a unitary transformation if and only if a set of polynomial invariants in the entries are the same. We, we take the traces of all the different words in A and A dagger, and we check out to a certain length and make sure that they're all the same. And for a given size of matrix, I suspect you're there, Laura, to tell me that I've got a finite number of minutes remaining. Uh, I should be done in seven, in, in seven minutes, which I think is what I'm aiming at, right? Yeah. Great. Um, or maybe uh, two minutes. Okay, somewhere between two and seven minutes, I'll be done, time for questions. Um, so the Specht's theorem says that if, if we check that each of these uh, words, the traces of the different words are equal up to a sufficient degree, we prove that the matrices are equivalent. So for instance, for two by two matrices, degree two is sufficient for three by three matrices, degree six is sufficient. Uh, for n by n matrices, it's been proven that the, num the degree you need to go to is on the order of n root n, um, it's conjectured, it's linear in N, but basically you need to go to higher and higher orders uh, to do this. How would machine learning do at trying to check if two matrices are related? Again, this is a simple version of our Calabi Yau problem. Rather than a three index tensor, we wanna check if two two index tensors now in the integers are related. So let's take some integer, real integer matrices like the Calabi Yau problem and ask, can a machine learning algorithm determine whether A and B are similar. So first let's just take a random A and a B and try a simple machine learning network where we have a couple of layers doing some ReLUs and you know, some, some standard nonlinearity. You plug it in using your favorite machine learning methodology and it works just fine. Okay, great. So it looks like machine learning does this. But notice that if I choose a random A and a B, their traces are generally different. So all you really need to do for random matrices to have a very high degree of accuracy is just check are the traces of the two matrices the same. And that's a very simple function. It's a linear function on the input. So now let's give it a little bit more of a challenge. Let's choose random matrices which are constrained so that the traces are the same. Now, if we plug it into a simple machine learning metric, um, it's not so good. If it's true that the matrices are the same, it'll say that they're the same 75% of the time. But if it's false, they will also say that they're true, that they're the same 61% of the time. So that's not so good. Uh, sorry, if it's false, it'll only be accurate 61% of the time. So it's not a, not a really, uh, uh, you know, banner uh, waving uh, level of accuracy. Now, if we change the network, by including explicitly products of the incoming numbers, rather than just the standard linear plus nonlinear in, in nodes, if we include products explicitly, then suddenly the accuracy shoots up. So we can discover essentially the quadratic term in Specht's theorem by changing the form of the network, including now um, 
nonlinear, an explicit kind of nonlinearity, which involves products of the different nodes. So the, meth the message here is it's actually hard to solve this problem, even for matrices with machine learning. And it can be made easier if you include additional structure in the uh, kinds of nonlinearities you allowed in the nodes. So I'm running out of time and actually we're kind of at a, at a partially, we're partially way through this project. So I don't have too much more that I really wanna say at this moment, but let me just give you a picture of, of what we're learning and where this goes. One of the messages here is that different basic functional units in the machine learning network may naturally perform better or worse on certain problems. And in this context, we can understand very explicitly why that is. By including these nonlinearities, we get the quadratic term in SPECT's theorem. Um, it was shown, uh, for instance, by Tegmark that you can get multiplication from general nonlinear layers, but it seems that actually it may take really long to converge to that. So while in principle, in some hypothetical massive uh, network, you would eventually get that quadratic term, it might take a very long time. There's a general question here, which is, are certain number theoretic and math problems intrinsically hard for machine learning? And I think that's a really important question that, that touches on a whole range of the problems that, that people here and, and, and in Yang's book have looked at related to uh, machine learning applied to these kinds of discrete problems. You know, generalizing this thing uh, about the products, can we find a general architecture that naturally learns just matrix similarity, the thing we already know how to solve mathematically? Can we generalize it to other problems? Can we learn anything about three index integer tensors? Can we leverage the elliptic structure? Uh, there's a whole set of questions related to the first part of my talk on the elliptic structure where we have a D which cubes to zero. Can we identify such Ds with machine learning and, and can we leverage that elliptic structure in identifying equivalents? Um, and can we use similar methods to discover other new mathematical relations? So that's my talk and I'm happy to entertain questions. I think I have a few minutes for that. Thank you very much for a great talk. Um, I have a question, but I'll let other people go first. Maybe James first and then George. Hey, thanks, Woody. Yeah, really nice talk. I just had a, a very simple question. When you talk about putting in these nonlinearities in the network, do you mean that as, as a sort of an input, you're putting in A, B and say A squared and B squared, or are you doing something intrinsically in the middle? Uh, so actually, so we the, the network has all the entries of the matrices, entries of the matrices coming in, like all the all the entries of A and all the entries of B. We yeah. explicitly have a layer where mm -hmm. we compute the product of each element of A with each element of B at the second layer. So I in see. that sense, the, what, we're, what we're getting out of, you know, the thing we need for Speck's theorem is some yeah. trace of a certain linear combination of the quadratic terms. And we mm -hmm. just give the network the ability to compute that, yeah. you know, n to the fourth set of products. Yeah. And then it does very well because all it needs to do yeah. is find the right linear combination of those things. So we're kind of, so I mean, it's- this is, yeah. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. So yeah, I mean, so this is probably very similar. If you if you just use a, a completely standard network and you gave it the entries of A squared and the entries of B squared, presumably it would find similar structure, right? Yes. Yeah, okay, yeah, great. Sorry, sorry. When I said A, A times B, I meant, you're absolutely right. I meant the elements of A times the other elements of A, the elements yeah, yeah. of B times the other, exactly. So if you just gave it those things, it would, it would find similar structure. That's right, well, thanks. Thanks very much, great. Yep. George? Okay. Um, hi, Wadi. Uh, uh, great talk. Um, I have a, a question about the first uh, part. So suppose sure. that really Kalabiaus are um, mostly elliptically fibered, okay? And, and, yeah. and you have a great deal of evidence, and Laura Jameson and, and people like that. Um, so, uh, so then the question comes back to sort of the origin of the discussion, going back to Busa, Polchinski, Douglas, about statistical reason. You see, the number, I think, of possibilities now is radically, I mean, it's much smaller than let's say 10 to the 120 that you need for statistical reasoning, you know, observer bias uh, based arguments for the cosmological constant. So if the number is smaller, what happens to that type of quote unquote anthropic or let's call it observer bias statistical reasoning regarding let's say vacuum energy? Great question. So let me make two comments on that. First of all, um, there are two senses in which the number still is larger than that 10 to the 120. The first sense is that actually, I mentioned that there are something like 400 million Calabia threefolds that are known. Those are, and most of those are elliptic. So we have some 400 million elliptic Calabia threefolds. If we go to fourfolds, so, the, so those, those, four, those are, if each of those that is known is fibered over a toric base 
And the bases, we, we, Dave Morrison and I enumerated those toric bases that are possible, um, starting from Antonelli Grassi's, you know, minimal models and blowing them up. There's about 65,000 bases that are possible for elliptic Calabi-Yau threefolds. If we go to four-dimensional models using F theory, now we have an elliptic Calabi-Yau fourfold. And so the very first thing we need to do is figure out how many bases are there. If we just look at toric bases for that would support an elliptic Calabi-Yau fourfold, um, the numbers there are astronomical. The, there is an explicit construction um, by, by uh, Cody Long and, and um, Jim Halverson and, um, and others, Ben, Ben at the, at the Northeastern group where they explicitly enumerated on the order of 10 to the 700 different toric bases. In a Monte Carlo analysis with Yunnan Wang, we gave an estimate of around 10 to the 3000 toric bases. So that's already 10 to the 3000, just as the number of geometries for the bases, which is analogous to the 65,000. So the number of elliptic Calabi-Yau fourfolds is already way, way larger than 10 to the 3000. That's the first comment. The second comment is that those really big numbers uh, that people get, like in, in, in Douglas and Denef and others, uh, flux estimates, you know, the famous um, yeah. 10 to the 500, which we've heard about, it, is, a, is yeah. a number of different fluxes. So if we go to those Calabi-Yau fourfolds, um, Yunan and I estimated for the Calabi-Yau fourfold that admits the largest number of fluxes, the number of possible flux vacua is on the order of 10 to the 273,000. So the numbers are just astronomical compared to that 10 to the 100, even though we have a finite number of Calabia threefolds and presumably, we know actually there was a nice um, proof uh, in recent years that there are a finite number of, of elliptic Calabia fourfolds. So we expect there are a finite number of Calabia fourfolds and certainly only, only the elliptic ones are relevant for 4DF theory. Even though there's a finite number of elliptic Calabia fourfolds, the numbers of those are already huge, even at the level of the number of geometries. And when you include fluxes, it just becomes tremendous. So I, I think actually it's a very promising program to try to understand if we've got all this stuff, what's the most common stuff that we see? What, you know, we're going to find the standard model all over the place. Uh, you know, there was a nice paper from, from Svetich and, and uh, Halverson and others with the quadrillion standard models, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. Those are not, those are actually very special finely tuned standard models. If we look generically, there are all these non higgsable clusters with E6, E7, and E8, which we could break down to the standard model. And I think there's an interesting story about what is the most natural way that the physics like that of the standard model arises. And I think there'll be way, way more than 10 to the 120 of those. Okay, Sorry, that's a very long winded answer, more. Okay, okay, no, no, that was a good answer, thanks. And I have one more. Oops, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, I don't know who was asking. I had one, but I, I don't want to jump. Over I think I was speaking. To I was just saying. Oh, thanks. sorry. Great. Okay. Last last quick question. Um, sure. This is a question about the the vibration scans and the cone structure. So yes. one of the things that James and I found a pain in the butt when we were trying to classify these for certain subsets is that to fully be sure that you're controlling the Kähler and Mori cones on the manifold, um, there's a few theorems, but Sort of in general, we didn't have great tools for that. Um, I know in you know the stuff that you and and uh, were, your students were doing in the past, it, it, you're looking for obvious vibrations, so that doesn't matter. But if you're if you're trying to sort of find all for the toric hypersurfaces, what are your thoughts on tools for determining the full cone structure? I think that's a great question. Um, I, I see that Mike Stillman is in the audience, who I think probably knows more about the cone structure than I do. Um, it's tricky because, as you know, it, with a toric hypersurface construction, you can get kind of a lower bound on the cone and an upper bound on the cone. You know, one of them comes from considering the Mori cone in the, you know, the cone in the Kähler cone or Mori cone in the ambient space. And the other one comes from sort of what you can obviously get from the hypersurface. And neither one of those is quite right. I don't know um, how to be really rigorous about nailing that down. I, I think that's a great question. And uh, maybe Mike, uh, if he's there, has some comment on that. Oh, I, think uh, I don't really have any comment. It's really hard. Um, I mean, I'm trying hard to understand that better. But, um. Fair enough. All right. Thanks. All right. Let's thank Wadi again for an excellent talk.